Hey guys, how we doing? Welcome back to another episode of For Checking TV. As always, I'm your host, Doug Lackey, and tonight I'm joined by my co-hosts, Scotty Porterfield and Trevin Catellis. And tonight we are joined by our very special guest, Jesse Marshall of The Athletic. Jesse, how you doing? Doing well, guys. Thanks uh, for having me on the show. Yeah, no problem, man. We're, we're really excited to have you on. Um, obviously, a lot of stuff to cover with free agency tomorrow. Um, lots of, you know, news today. Uh, most importantly, probably the most newsworthy thing for at least the Pittsburgh area is Marc-Andre Fleury was traded from Vegas to Chicago today for a minor league forward. And there's speculation that he may not report to Chicago. Um, and that allegedly retirement is on the table. So what are we thinking about that, guys? Yeah, I think it's uh, – well, the whole thing's kind of crappy, right? Like Elliot Friedman uh, just about 20 minutes ago came out with a little bit additional detail about the story and basically admitted, look, you know, like the news did break, you know, before they had a chance to talk to him. And that just sucks, you know. But like, this is not a guy – who's in his second year in the league you know this isn't like a rookie this is a guy who just won the Vezina trophy right just think about that just won the Vezina trophy is arguably one of the best bullies in the game is well respected from this in the sport from top to bottom no person will utter a bad word about Mark andre Fleury because there's not a bad word to utter and you just feel bad I and mean, that's really what it comes down to you were about like 10 days I think it was from him being able to submit a partial no trade list 10 days so it was like right there where he would have been able it was 10 days or 10 hours one of the two was it hours it might have been hours i don't know one of the either way you get the point like he was right at the cusp of being able to sort of like manifest his own destiny um i wouldn't blame anybody for not wanting to go to chicago right now for any plethora of reasons <laughs> you know pick them um it's it's frustrating for him. I think that he he deserved probably a little bit more. And ultimately, I think that, you know, now that the dust is settled, I think that not to like poo-poo on anybody's parade here, but I think the interest in a return to Pittsburgh is solely a one-way street right now. Like I think Mark Andre Fleury is probably the one that's like driving that bus. Um, that's not to say that the Penguins don't have like a level of interest there. I think they probably do, but given their salary cap, you know, situation they're going to have to find a solution for some of that money, right? Um, I've seen everything tonight from speculating that Buffalo is a team that's going to be involved here and they're going to somehow launder some of the money and Jack Eichel's going somewhere. I mean, I've seen every like conspiracy theory you could drum up. I think, I think it's certainly something that both, you know, both parties, probably more so the goaltender have an interest in whether or not it's tangible is another story. And they're not going to save that much money on long-term injured reserve. Malkin's not, I mean, he's going to be out for a decent amount of time, but not enough that you're banking millions and millions of dollars against the cap, right? You're going to have to fill out the rest of this team. You still have, I mean, unless you're planning on playing Nathan Legary, Sam Polian, and Philip Hollander, <laughs> I don't think that's you know, a really good idea. Um, I just, it, it's going to be really difficult to do it. If they pull it off, it's going to have to be with a little bit of creativity. I wouldn't rule it out. But I do think that that right now, Mark andre Fleury is kind of probably a little bit upset um, and is looking at either getting himself moved to a preferable destination or just simply not playing anymore. Here is a, uh, a statement that uh, was released from Fleury, seeing it through Elliot Friedman right now, saying, quote, I want to thank all the amazing fans in Vegas and my teammates for four incredible years together. You embraced me and my family from day one and made playing games at the Fortress one of the greatest joys of my life. We will miss playing in Vegas very much, but I am grateful for my time in your city. So right off the bat there, you read the statement. He doesn't mention anything about saying, you know, with that being said, I'm really excited to join the Chicago Blackhawks organization. I'm looking forward to winning some hockey games. Like usually whenever a player puts out a statement like this, you usually say, oh, here's, here's looking forward to the next step. And you don't hear that from Flower in this statement. So clearly it doesn't seem like Chicago is a very big priority to him. And like you said, Jesse, I'm sure Flowers weighing the options right now. He's looking at it saying, okay, do I want to, you know, retire and just ride off in the sunset because I have nothing left to prove at this point. I've won over 400 games in the NHL. My name's on the cup three times. Or do I want to try and run it back one more time with a different team? Maybe not the Penguins, maybe someone else. Who knows? 
you know, these are the things that he has to think about. And obviously we're going to be getting down to, and he does have some time to consider his options, obviously, because the season isn't starting for another uh, two or three months. So he still has some time to figure things out, but uh, a lot of things for Marc-Andre Fleury to get in order here as we head down into the summer. I just think it's shitty that we had to find out. Like you're going to find out via Twitter before Vegas even tells you. I mean, that's just pretty cold in my opinion. But I, I 100% agree with you. Uh, and, I, and I'll tell you something else too, Scott, that you mentioned is about that statement. We we can kind of like parse a, 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 a part what he said a little bit. He didn't think the ownership group in Vegas. He didn't think this coaching staff there either. I mean, those are two pretty glaring omissions from my perspective. The journey is like, and I was having this conversation with a couple of people on Twitter today. If you really think about it, you go back to like the beginning of Marc-Andre Fleury's career, in Cape Breton, like not even talking about like the Penguins, like he had those fairly difficult World Junior Championship performances that people immediately knocked him for. The whole country was on him about it, uh, and he took an absolute beating uh, from the whole country for a really long time. Uh, goes to Cape Breton, gets beat on there, comes to Pittsburgh, you know, wins a cup, gets replaced by Tomas Vukun, not unrightfully. I mean, he struggled, right? That was a, a kind of a brutal time for him. Regains his form just as Matt Murray shows up, doesn't get to play in the cup finals, you know, as a result of that. Goes to Vegas, doesn't win there. Uh, coach gets fired because he has a struggle point. New coach comes in, doesn't trust him, plays Robin Leonard all the time, and now he's in Chicago. <laughs> that is not, like, that is not the resume of a guy, like, that has Marc-Andre Fleury's record book and, and, and win total and I mean, that's just a brutal career. It is top to bottom. There, everywhere he's been, he's run into some kind of thing that he's handled with the utmost professionalism. So like, Trevin, you said like, oh, they, they owe him that. They absolutely owe him that. They owe him nothing less than that. And to call him on the phone, they, this, and if you follow, and then Elliot didn't say this outright tonight, right? Like he, I think he kind of um, conscientiously danced around it, but but you do the math, right? I mean, if you look at some of the of Elliot's tweets and you time this out, and you kind of follow the breadcrumbs, there's a you know for me anyway, there's a period of time here where you know you you they had an opportunity I think to, to break the news to him maybe a little bit sooner, um, you know they, they the first date I think Elliot threw out was July twelfth, right? was the first time that this had been discussed if i'm them i'm picking up the phone on july 12th and saying hey mark andre i'm just letting you know we're having this conversation about chicago it's not there yet right but take some time to chew on it and think about it we'll come back when, when there's something to talk about that seems like a no-brainer to me right like i i don't i don't doesn't appear anyway that that happened anywhere in this situation it's like you said jesse you, you just described it perfectly you know Mark andre Fleury is most likely going to be a Hall of Fame goaltender, but it's probably one of the most – it's probably one of the weirdest careers we've ever seen. I talked about it with Doug and with Doug early on. Think about it. Just focus on the Pittsburgh timeline. You know, you're drafted first overall. The team's putting their faith in you to be the, you know, the guy in a way. You make, you make that Cups winning save, you know, on a Hall of Fame defenseman, Nick Lidstrom. You fall on hard times for the next three or four years. You almost get run out of town in the process. You redeem yourself. You become the face of Vegas. Then you become, you know, you fall on hard times again. Peter DeBoer, you know, stabs you in the back. And then you end up winning the Vesna. You end up winning the Vesna at age 36. And then you end up getting traded the year after you win a Vesna. Actually, the summer after you win a Vesna. I mean, it's just, it's just a weird career arc. And you don't, I don't think we'll ever see a career path like that again. Like ever. No chance. I, I kind of got caught up today a little bit too. I think in, in the cap space piece to this, there's like, this was such a cap space move for Vegas. You know, they needed this money to fill out, you know, some holes they think they have in their roster. But I, I guess for me, I, I wasn't initially shocked by the fact that the return was, you know, basically a, a minor leader than ever is going to report to the organization in the first place. But while like, I, I was really, like, I really thought about it afterwards. Like, yeah, he won the Vezina. Like you literally, I mean, what's what's like the like the NBA MLB like NFL equivalent to that? You know, like trading an MVP for nothing. You know, you just don't see it. It just doesn't happen that way. And like obviously, if the NFL get contracts aren't even guaranteed, so you could just cut somebody and it wouldn't even make a difference. But I mean, it, it really is like coming off the back of like what happened with Tampa, you know, and like the the whole like over the cap win the cup thing, and and now you've kind of got like you know potentially the same thing happening with Shea Weber we don't really know like Montreal's got a lot of shady stuff going on like 
you know, the carry price thing in the way that they handled that with the expansion draft was sort of like this, you know, the whole thing for me, but uh, I mean, it really is kind of unprecedented and it's probably the last time in the history of this league that a Vezina trophy winner is going to get traded for absolutely nothing. And, uh, you know, we probably ought to at least take a moment to acknowledge that. I think, I, I think I lost that in the, in all the news of today that it pretty, it pretty much is an unprecedented situation. Yeah, that is the craziest part of all of this. And I, ironically enough, it happened 20 years to the day, to the day that uh, Dominic Hasha got traded after winning the Vesna Trophy. Um, I saw that in a tweet huh. earlier today, I think from Frank Saravalli. So that's kind of crazy. And just a little factoid here. He was dealt for uh, Kozlov, a first-round selection in the 2002 draft. Which eventually became Jim, and which eventually became uh, Jim Slater. So, just a little shout out there for what Dom Hashik's return was compared to Mark Andre Fleury. A little bit of a miss in the Jim Slater piece, but you know, I'd say so. Try, yeah, it's yep. all right. Atlanta Thrashers legend Jim Slater. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, and the thing with Pittsburgh um, looks like everybody kind of going into a frenzy um, is, and we touched on this earlier, Scotty. Really, the only way that it makes sense for the Penguins is if he's laundered through a three-team trade where 75% of the cap is eaten. And, you know, I don't, I'm not sure, like, how much, how, how much assets that would take, but, like, you get to a point where you question, would that actually be worth it? I, you know, there's moves to be made, right? I mean – Certainly trading Jason Zucker doesn't improve your situation on the wing any, right? I mean, that, that, that doesn't, you, you've still got to address that. We've talked about that. Mm -hmm. I do think guys, like to be completely frank with you, one of the solutions to wing is Philip Hollander is going to play. I just like, I watched a bunch of video last week. I watched a ton of games. He's ready to go. I really don't get the sense that there's any reason to play him in Wilkes-Barre Scranton. And if he comes in and has a good camp, I would say that's the contingency. He's got to come in and have a good camp. If he comes in and he doesn't look ready, you can't just squeeze him in there. I don't think he, he's going to come in looking bad. I mean, I, I think there's one solution there that's cheap and potentially an exciting one. But you, my point is, it's like you just can't create more problems for yourself. Let's say what's a reasonable number? Like hypothetically, we'll say you can launder two to two and a half million dollars of this contract somewhere else. I think that's reasonable, right? I don't think 50% is reasonable. I don't think anybody's taking that on. Uh, if you could get to two, two and a half million, you're looking at a decently priced contract, you know, four, four and a half, five million dollars. But you, you know, that basically gives you a million and a half to play with to sign a left wing. You know, I mean, like, so I, you know, I, I get it. Like, I, I think maybe you look at a Marcus Pedersen as a guy that you could throw into a deal and open up a little bit more room with. Um, I think you just have to be careful. You know, this team was really good last year. With average goaltending, they beat the New York Islanders. Full stop. Not even close. Game series over. We're playing the you know, you go on, we're all watching this Boston series, right? But you can't over address a problem, right? Like I think like would it be nice to have Marc Andre Fleury at five and a half million? Absolutely. Would it be nice to have Linus Olmark at three million? And then you take the rest of that money and do something else with it. Sure. Like I would probably take that too. I don't think this is an area where you and look, it's hard to take the nostalgia out. Right. Like I was having a conversation this morning before any of this news even broke about uh, being, you know, like 18 years old and cutting in line uh, with my student rush ticket on Flurry's opening uh, night. I literally cut in line is the only reason I got in. I cut in front of thousands of people. And it was the only reason I got into the arena because we were all so hyped up. You know, you can't take that away from people. You, you know, you just erase that. You know, this, this, this is a player who, like, meant a, a turning point in this franchise to, like, so many people, myself included. You know, like, before I wrote about this team, I was down there drinking beer, like, sneaking flasks in, like, doing all that stuff. You know, like, this, that was me. So, you know, it's hard to take that away. But I, I think in this case, you kind of have to – you have to evaluate this for what it is and say, like, look, you know, and I think that's what Ron Hextall is doing right now. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if the Penguins ownership group was more eager to make this happen than Ron Hextall was. He doesn't have that emotional connection. He knows he's a good goalie, right? He knows he's one of the better goalies in the game, but there's a cost analysis that has to occur here. If there's a right path to do it, I think they'll certainly make the attempt. 
Um, I just question whether or not that is the case, given some of the other things that have to take place with this team. Yeah, I, I, I agree. That's a really good point. Um, bringing up the idea of Linus Omark at 3 million um, sounds awesome to me. Um, he's somebody that I've been eyeing up since probably the day after the Islander series concluded. Um, now, if they were to add a left winger in free agency, who, who are you thinking? Like, who do you have your eye on? You know what is frustrating about this free agency class is that it's really not very good. Uh, <laughs> like, we start, like the fact that I'm bringing up uh, Linus Olmark, um, you know, it's, it's kind of like the, you know, sort of uber goaltending signing that the Penguins could probably afford, I think says a lot. Um, I, I mentioned Philip Hollander, I and mean, I'm, I'm going to, you know, keep that name in there because I, I, I know it's not necessarily an acquisition, you know, per se, um, but it's one that, you know, I think is worth looking into. Uh, I, several people, guys, asked me today on Twitter whether or not I would look into Zach Parise, and the answer to that question was no, uh, I would not. Um, I think Granlin is another name that got thrown around a, a lot um, that I, I don't think the Penguins would be in on. I think you're probably looking more like closer to like um, a player of the, and I'm not saying this player specifically, but I think about like a Matthias Yanmark who's coming off like what two and a quarter million dollars, right? Mm-hmm. Um, can play all three forward positions. Basically, you, you're going to catch him on special teams. Um, I, I I'm thinking that it's going to be something of that ilk, shall we say? Um, I wouldn't wouldn't rule out and again we, we got to be careful here right because like there i think realistically you know money wise again you're, you don't want to dig yourself in a hole but nick Ritchie is another one i'll throw out there um versatile forward you can plug in a lot of different places um uh, still has decent wheels i think fits in with the way that the penguins want to play that sort of like up for that up tempo for checking style um not a replacement you know for a brand antenna by any stretch of the imagination but uh, plays the style I think that kind of slides into this system pretty well so it's going to be off the cuff like that I think it's going to be you know something out of left field that that uh, Ron Hextall has been cooking up for you know quite some time but you're looking I think anyway at names that are in that tier shall we say of availability I'm glad that you brought up uh, Nick Ritchie because that was somebody I was about to bring up right after you got done making your point because you know, bigger forward, like you said, he still can skate, still pretty quick with it, and he can play a physical game. Um, and I think that's something that a lot of people have been looking for. Um, I'd imagine that Brian Burke, that's something that he wants the team to address. But, um, you know, again, like he's not really fully in control. Ron Hextall is, but I'd imagine that that would make a lot of people within the organization happy if they were to pursue someone like Nick Ritchie. Yeah. And like, I know a lot of people, I like, kind of have that brand inside connection, you know, and they're kind of, you know, throwing that about too. But I, I, I still think that that's a, that's a price conversation. Um, I, I, I don't, I don't know that that's going to be an area that the, the Penguins can compete in um, and wouldn't rule out too, by the way, guys, you know, if, 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 you're, if a trade is made and we keep talking about Marcus Pedersen, right. Is like one of the guys that you could potentially, you know, potentially see moved for cap space. Um, I think you could glean a decent forward for him, right? Like I, that's a kind of trade for me. That's like a one for one hockey trade, right? Like a hall for Larson type deal, only more fair. Um, you know, you know, any number of names that you throw out. I mean, like Anaheim's kind of, you know, uh, dangled Raquel out there. That's, that's one that, you know, I've, I've talked about a lot, not that Anaheim would want Marcus Pedersen back, but you think you get where I'm going with that. Um, it's a hockey trade that makes sense. And, and I think it services both teams. So I wouldn't rule that out either. I mean, I, you know, I, I still think that they're, they're looking for ways to, to free up space. And, um, you know, Marcus Pedersen is very good at one thing and that's like playing defense and making sure teams can't get the puck in on his side of the ice. But I think like the value you get out of him offensively, the way he supports your forwards, et cetera, et cetera, right? It's kind of not there. Um, uh, So that's something to to keep an eye on, I think, as well. 
Sorry, I, I stumbled there because I just got an alert on my phone that the, the, somebody texted me that the Oilers were going to sign Cody CC. I just thought how unfortunate for him. <laughs> I hope he gets I paid. Know, that's, I think I saw something before we started. The number is going to be, be between three and a half and four and a half million a year, apparently. So that's a that's a pretty big ticket for him coming off of a big rebound season here. So yeah. good for him. So he definitely earned it. But um, I don't know. That's that's interesting that you brought up the idea of like one for one hockey trade for Marcus Patterson because I feel like that's exact. That might be exactly what Ron Hextall is trying to do. Um, like we've seen a lot of defensemen that are arguably the Marcus Patterson is arguably a lot better than or a lot more valuable than going for futures type returns, and it made me wonder like is Marcus Patterson actually available or is, or is Ron Hextall trying to work on something bigger to help the team now rather than recouping assets? I think it's about that. I think it's about making the team better now without sacrificing assets. I think it's about doing whatever you can to get yourself in a position where you feel like your hockey team is better without giving up a single pick. <laughs> a single one. Um, I, you know, I think he's planning, he, Ron Hextall, is planning to be here for an extended period of time, right? Um, and I think knowing that he knows that the turnaround and like the pivot that you make here, you know, it can be quick or it can be long. You could do it in a way that the Rangers did it, where you kind of like, you know, make it a quick, a quick, you know, switch, or you could do the Detroit model and it's going to take 15 years. So, I mean, I think that, you know, that that's something that's at the forefront of his mind. And you've heard him say things like, Oh, um, you know, we, we, you know, Poland and Legary are basically untouchable for us, you know, not wanting to give up a POJ, you know, these are all like, I think very much realizations of if we can extract talent at entry level cost, we're only doing ourselves a favor uh, and we're enabling ourselves to build for the future. Because look, it's like, uh, I was talking to Corey Pronman uh, and Scott Wheeler from the athletic, you know, about the Penguins draft and they graded it really harshly. And I was like, what, you know, I thought it was a little bit better than, than you guys. Like, where are you at? And they're like, we only had five picks. Like, if you only have five picks, you have to make a home run somewhere, right? And I don't, nobody feels like they did. So it's just that lack of overall sort of, you know, um, goodness in the cupboard uh, that I think is, is like a, a real cause for concern. There's not a single defenseman in the system behind Pierre Olivia Joseph that's going to play in the National Hockey League for a really long time. So, you know, you've right there, you've, you've already got yourself like, uh, you know, I think the Hextall knows what's good in, in that regard. And uh, any deal that's made for me um, is just not simply not going to include uh, any any form of, of pick related asset or prospect related assets just does not have that capital to do it. Okay, very interesting. Now I'm going to ask you about a prospect right now. Um, who's about to make the jump to North American ice this uh, season, Valtteri Pustin. Um, what can we expect from him? And how close do you think he could be to potentially making an impact? Uh, not close. Uh, I think that, and I don't want to like poo poo on him because uh, he's, you know, from a skills perspective is like an extremely talented player. Uh, but, you know, I mentioned to you guys earlier that I didn't think that Philip Hollander was going to have like that big time, you know, big to small ice surface adjustment. Whereas like with Poston, and I think you'll see that. I think it'll be tougher for him. Not that he's a perimeter player, but he utilizes that width more. That's just the reality of the situation. Like he, he utilizes it way more than Hollander does. And I think that the challenge for him is going to be finding ways to, to, you know, his one of his strengths, you know, outside of his shot is his ability to create time and space where there isn't any time and space. You know, that's the hallmark, really, I think, of any good-handed forward, any forward with good hands or any forward that's going to look to create and drive offense. I think it's going to – not to say he can't do it when he gets here, but there's going to be a size adjustment, speed adjustment, width adjustment. I don't think he'll play in the league next year. Um, I think he's going to take some time. Um, I think he is a player that has the potential to play in the league, but the path to get there may be a little bit longer. It's, a, it's, 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 I think, a player that's worth the return on investment. Um, I, I don't agree necessarily with the opinion. Um, I, I've talked to a couple of scout friends of mine that are really down on him, which I think is crazy, and I don't agree with that. 
I think it's a lot of like sort of like Euro uh, xenophobia for me that he's not this and he's not, you know, just the, some of the s- typical stereotypes. Uh, I'm not like concerned about where he is as a prospect. I think that he's just, you know, uh, a player that for me anyway, is going to have to take, take a bite out of the North American apple and, um, you know, see how things go on this, on this bit of a different ice surface. Interesting. Now, before we were talking about the Penguins draft a little bit, um, who is your favorite pick from that draft and why? Like, who is your favorite Penguin selection? Uh, it's Tristan Bros. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I love USHL players to start. Um, but this is one that, you know, the best way I could describe this, like, I wrote in my, you know, like, quick analysis of him that he, like, completely shit on people in the USHL playoffs. But I feel like young players sometimes have, like, a light bulb series or a light bulb time in their, their sort of, like, career where they realize that they're better than everybody else. And they start to do things with the puck that they change the tempo of the game. They'll speed it up. They slow it down. They keep it on their stick longer. They wait they, that extra little bit of patience. You know, like we see Sidney Crosby do all the time. He'll just outweigh you, you know, and then you're staring at him. And while you're staring at him, you know, he just dangled one backhand to a wide open teammate. And that's kind of what his story was in the playoffs is it wasn't so much the goal scoring for me as it was that he was just better than everybody else. Um, You know, you think back to, think back to Sidney Crosby against Nashville. He didn't score a ton of goals, right? But he was the best player on the ice those last two games of that series. Nobody could beat him. And that's basically, I think, what you got um, out of Tristan in the USHL playoffs. Um, And they ran up against, you know, they got really far and ran up against the absolute buzzsaw of a team. Um, and he was very good in that series. Wasn't the reason they lost, and, uh, but you know, probably had a chance to, to take the whole thing. Uh, and I'm excited too because Minnesota is such a good program. Um, I'm. I think that if you're looking for a name uh, beyond that, it's Carol Tankov, because he's just uh, a raw weapon of offense that doesn't really try to play physically, doesn't really care about the system much. <laughs> Uh, doesn't play within the constraints of a role or responsibility, but does things with the puck that you probably could take his individual skill set and stack it up against anybody in that draft class. Honest to goodness, like, I don't think that's a bizarre statement to make. Like, I think from his shot, his dangle ability, um, all that stuff, it's all up there with, like, you know, first, second, third round talent. Everything else is just complete chaos. I think I get the impression he's a difficult guy to try to control. There are points in some of the games I watched where they just benched him for extended periods of time, I think, because like, you know, he's supposed to be on one side of the ice, but he sensed an offensive opportunity on the other. So he left and went to it, you know, and, you know, he's supposed to be playing on the left. You know, you'd watch a game and he, there he is standing right next to his teammate on the, on the right side. And he's like, what are you doing over there? You know, but then he got the puck on his stick, dangled through four guys and scored. So it's like, how mad can you really be about that? I don't know that he even has an interest in coming to the National Hockey League. He got passed over last year. Um, my buddy, Mike, who's a scout with the Dallas Stars organization, told me that he's, he was aghast that he didn't get picked last year. He's like, I thought that was criminal. I thought it was stupid. Like he should have gotten picked up last year. Uh, but, you know, does he want to come over and play here? He hasn't really expressed the, a desire to, um, you know, so I, I think it's kind of a fun player to watch because it's rare. If you're going to make a pick in the seventh round, right, late, that's the one you make. Take the kid with offensive skills that are literally up there with, you know, some of the top players in the, in the draft and hope that you can kind of nurse him along in other areas of the game. Uh, that's fun to me. I mean, that's what that's what seventh round drafting is all about. So good on Hextall for that. I thought that was a good get and uh, worth keeping an eye on at least, you know, and it's, it's the KHL second division. It's not, uh, you know, the upper division of the KHL that he was playing in. So it's a bit of a different, different circumstances, but you know, it's, it's, it's at least one worth keeping an eye on again. Yeah. I mean, it might just be the KHL second division, but there were some pretty good players that came oh, out. You got, yeah. There. And you guys um, saw the videos, I'm sure. I mean, on YouTube, oh like it's disgusting. Yeah, it's stupid. Yes. And it's, it's it 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 really is that gross within the game. Like he's just doing that level of stuff. You could just 
you know, you could cut a, a shift of a regular Tuesday afternoon game and, you know, put, put it, put that on YouTube. People would think it was a whole montage, but, you know, th there's uh, something, you know, it, it, it's just that, you know, to me, it was like watching uh, a really gifted athlete that could already ice skate and shoot and do all these things that had never actually played hockey before, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and like, you kind of just plop them out there <laughs> and uh, that's what you would end up with is a, a really talented player with just absolutely no sense of direction in any other aspect of the game. That's unreal. And it's honestly so much better than them taking a shot on a guy who's probably going to only be like an AHL bottom six forward. Yeah, like, it's like Joe awesome. Brown out of the Ontario Hockey League again. You know, here's your, exactly. you know, like, you know, at best, you know, he's a 13th forward. You know, this is a player that, you know, if you're going to do it, do a Yanni Pessinen, right? You know, go out there and get the gold helmet with the crazy music and the YouTube video. Like, that's that to me is marketing. You know, <laughs> that's the way to do it. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. That's incredible. But um, I, I had one more free agency related question that popped into my head. Pius Suter, not qualified by the Chicago Blackhawks. Um, do you think that there's any way the Penguins would be able to pop into that market? Um, yeah, I think so. I, I think the lack of an offer was surprising. Uh, for when well, he had 14 goals last year, right? I think 14 goals in 50 some games. Yeah. Uh, most of those were at even strength. Mm -hmm. Um, there's a, I think obviously arbitration is the big, you know, that arbitration is very favorable, favorable to suitor in this situation. I mean, he, look at the numbers, right? Um, the report was that it wasn't even really close. Um, so I think, you know, I, I hate to keep beating on this drum for the Penguins, but it's like, what does it look like for them? You know, what. I don't know what those numbers were, right? So I, I don't know what it is he's looking for, but I mean, you've had so many players of that unassuming ilk come through Pittsburgh and have success. Like Dominic Cahoon, who's I thought was very good here. Um, I, I, this, I think Suter is infinitely more talented than him uh, and plays again, a game that that's pretty suited to the way that the Penguins want to do, want to do things. Um, so, you know, I don't know what's going on in Chicago, but that's one, you know, worth keeping an eye on for me. Yeah. He's just like somebody that I have like circled in as somebody that they should be looking at simply because if you look at how he performed, just like I test, and then you add in like metrics and things of that nature, it looks like he's one of those guys who could single-handedly replace the production that Jared McCann had by himself. Yeah, I was just going to say and, that. He kind of strikes you as that form of player, right? Like that kind of kind of the same style I think that you're getting out of that is a guy who can walk the puck off the wall. You could probably throw him on a second power play unit and in the same position McCann was in and try to reap the same rewards out of it. Um, that's a really, I think it's a good comparison. Yeah, definitely, definitely. All right, guys, is there anything else that you have for Jesse? All right, so we're good. I'll leave you with this. All right. Wait. That's fantastic. That's my guess. Like it. I, really I also like don't it. think I don't. I also don't think that'll be the only thing coming over from Arizona. Dvorak. No, I think I think it might be. If you don't they, mind, they, you... I wouldn't rule out a Rick Tockett return to Pittsburgh. Season starts. Yeah, anytime, gentlemen. And, um, you know, I'm, the dad life is, this is it now. This is all I got. So anytime you need me on the podcast, uh, <laughs> as long as the baby's sleeping, you got it. Uh, it sounds good. We'll keep that in mind. All right, man. Thank you so much. Uh, this was another episode of Four Checking TV. Be sure to follow us on Twitter at Four Checking TV. Subscribe to us on YouTube and Find us wherever you get your podcasts from. All right, guys. Thank you. Have a good night.